Hello and welcome to the December 2023 presentation here on Bright Talk on the People First Potential channel. I'm Deb Calvert and I'm really glad you're joining for this particular workshop. It's an important one and I'm going to load you up with some bonus resources and give you some ideas about other places to go for more information than I can pack into just 45 minutes here. Uh, but let me just say a few things first logistically. For those who are new to Bright Talk, look right below the slide that you see on screen and notice the tab that says Attachments. Be sure and go there because the first thing that you might want to do is download the slides that I'm using. That'll give you a chance to take some notes along the way. Uh, but I've also given you a, a way to connect with me on LinkedIn, and I hope that you will because I, I do post a lot there about uh, upcoming workshops and other opportunities that you might have, but mainly because I want to be able to answer your questions that you might have after the, the live session. Maybe you're listening on demand, or maybe you came live, but then you went to put some of these ideas into practice and you got stuck, or you had an idea, or you just wanted to talk with somebody about it. So let's do that. Just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, there are other attachments there. I won't go into detail on every single one of them, but let me be sure and point out the ones that are related to People First Leadership Academy. So here on Bright Talk, this is ideal for presentations that are sort of um, one directional. I talk and, and you listen, and we don't have a lot of, of interaction. But over on the Leadership Academy, we have 60 some odd classes that are highly interactive. Most of them are. Uh, some are intensive immersion experiences with multiple sessions. And some are 90 minute workshops where we use a little tool called Mentimeter to do some live polling and all kinds of other sorts of interaction to get you know right down to the kinds of things that, that you wanna talk about and the examples that you bring. A lot of those classes over there at People First Leadership Academy, just like here on Bright Talk, are free. And so you might as well go over and, and dive in and see what you can find there. But so long as you're here on Bright Talk, please note that on this channel, we will be in 2024 entering our seventh year of working with Bright Talk and putting up content a couple times a month. So there's a whole big body of work that you can go and, and find and many topics that are uh, related to this one. And, and we'll give you extensions from what we discussed today. All right, one more thing logistically before we dive in, and that is that I greatly appreciate your feedback. It, whether you're on demand, whether you're live, however you're listening here, would you please leave me a review when we get all wrapped up? Because that helps me. It helps me to continually improve. It helps me to know what you're experiencing uh, as a viewer. It helps me to know what kinds of topics or other things you might like in the future. And it helps other people find this content. So um, you know, post your reviews and give me a, a rating, uh, whatever stars you think uh, have been earned that particular session. And um, let's just make sure that, that we get this in front of other people because it's, it's meant to, to do good in the world. Okay, now today's topic, we're going to talk about conflict, we're going to talk about team effectiveness, we're going to talk about uh, how those things really do fit together, and, and they should always be thought of together. The most highly effective teams have healthy conflict. They don't duck, dodge, or deny it. They enter in. And they do that because they have a high degree of trust among team members. And they do it because that's how great ideas get surfaced. That's how bigger problems get averted. That's how commitment and buy-in build so that every single member of the team is using their voice and is being genuinely considered and feels, genuinely deeply feels a sense of belonging within the team because they've been consulted and their ideas have been considered. Now, teams that do this, instead of indulging in false harmony where they just go along to get along, teams that do this, they also avoid groupthink, which is a pretty dangerous phenomenon. It happens when there's a lot of head bobbing or when there's uh, someone in the group who has a dominant voice that sort of suppresses the input of others. So that the benefits are huge and can't be overstated. 
I'll touch on them a little bit as we go here, but I also want to show you how to fit the pieces together. Uh, for those who I haven't met before, um, thank you again for being here. Please take down my email address, which is on screen, because I, I genuinely mean it. I'd love to have those after the session interactions and find out how you're using what we talk about here in live time. Um, I am certified in the Thomas Kilman body of work that includes the TKI, the Thomas Kilman Conflict Instrument Mode over at Kilman Diagnostics. And so I'm going to be speaking to you a bit from that body of work toward the end. But I'm also a, a, an executive coach and I've been in business uh, here at People First Productivity Solutions for 18 years. Before that, I was a Fortune 500 corporate HR director and I've worked with a lot of companies in a lot of different sectors, all sizes of businesses. So I'm speaking to you from research, but also from my own personal observations. And if I say anything at all that you want to dive into deeper, let me know and I'll, I'll point you toward that research or we can uh, take a deeper dive. Okay, now I do want to say this. I genuinely believe that most people do what they do because they think it's the right thing to do. In that moment, they feel, believe, think it's the right way to respond, the right action to take. But here's the problem. You know, we all have some unconscious biases, but we're not aware of them necessarily. And a whole lot of workplace conflict ends up being based on misunderstandings and missed opportunities because of that, that unconscious bias or that um, fast thinking that fuels the problem. And I want to give you just one example here because honestly, I, I, I don't want this in any way, shape, or form throughout the session today. I don't want this to seem like there's any finger pointing going on. So let me just kind of dial in with this. This is how we all operate. We operate with this thing called the fundamental attribution error, which I've attempted to illustrate for you here. This is an unconscious bias. You know, we make very positive rationales for the things that we do, and we tend to look more negatively and make some assumptions about what other people do. So this is how it plays out. When there is a positive outcome, let's say there's been a job promotion. If it was yours, you got promoted. You tend to attribute that to your personality, to your innate characteristics, to how hard you've worked and all that you've done to earn that promotion. But when somebody else gets a promotion, especially if you were vying for it, we tend to make sort of um, externalized assumptions. We say, well, that person got promoted because they played the game. They had the politics in their favor. They lucked into it somehow. We, we attribute our gain to something that we've done and to our own characteristics, but we attribute others' gain to something outside of them. Now, when something negative happens, uh, someone got fired. I'm sorry if that was you, um, but if it was you, you probably attributed that to externalized factors. It wasn't fair because you were a victim of politics or bad luck or circumstances outside your own control. But if it's somebody else who got fired, well then, then we tend to say it's about that person. It's, it's their characteristics, it's their personality, it's their lack of hard work. Something about the individual is what we put the, the reason around that, that negative thing for. Now, let me give you a classic example to, to illustrate this. And if you've been around for a whole lot of these sessions, you may have heard me use this example before, but I'll, I'll use it again because I think it very, very nicely sums up this thing called the fundamental attribution error. Think about the last time that you were driving down the highway and someone cut you off in traffic. Your instant white hot response was that that person was, well, 
we'll skip the four letter words. Uh, that person was an idiot. That person doesn't know how to drive. That person is irresponsible. That person is trying to kill somebody. Okay. All kinds of negative associations about their personality or about their innate characteristics. But think about the last time you were in traffic driving down the highway and you cut someone off. You, you immediately felt bad. You immediately said things about external factors. I couldn't help it. The signs were poorly marked. That other guy didn't let me in. I didn't see you. It was a mistake. So we um, externalize when it's us. And when it's someone else, we point the finger at them. Now, this kind of fast thinking, because if you slow down and you break it down, of course, you, you know better than everything I've described. But, but we react to the fast thinking. It's exactly what causes a lot of conflict in the workplace. Because once we've had a sort of an assumption that we make about someone, it sticks, especially if we talk about it, especially if we dwell on it. And those ill will feelings make it very difficult for the other person to ever be able to get on equal footing with us and to get a fair shot in our, in, in our minds. So we've got to be really careful and recognize and openly talk about this kind of thing if we are ever to have really good team effectiveness. Now that unconscious bias that I mentioned, this is just one. There are a whole lot of them. And I have a, a workshop over on People First Leadership Academy that, that breaks down quite a few of the most common ones in a way that is no blame, shame, no bad feelings. It, it's just about developing awareness. And um, my new book, Discover Questions for Connections, Clarity, and Control, also has a section about unconscious bias that's really, really helpful for, for building team effectiveness. What do I mean? When I say team effectiveness, well, I, I really like this definition. I like it because it captures a piece that's usually forgotten. See, team effectiveness, it's not just the capacity of this group of people, not just them, and, and the measurements you might have about their shared goals, but it's also an acknowledgement that the individuals are interdependent. I depend on you and you depend on me and we both depend on someone else who equally depends on us. Right? That interdependence, we've got to create relationships and, and keep them in good standing because of that interdependence. But the other piece of this that often gets forgotten is that truly effective teams, they look out for each other. The, the members of the team, they, they look out for each other so that it's not just a focus on the shared goals and objectives, but there is an understanding that each member of the team also has individual goals and objectives, and we're all here to help one another reach both the shared and the individual goals. You become stronger because I know about, care about, contribute to, uh, make allowances for, have an interest in your goals. and you reciprocate. <laughs> you, you know my goals, you know what's on my mind, and we support one another in ways that are deeply meaningful. Of course, we cannot, we will not do that uh, if we're focused instead on anything competitive or on anything that, that takes away from our interdependence. So I'm going to talk about two of the primary drivers that get in the way of this. Two of the primary drivers of unproductive conflict, that's conflict that is deeply personalized, I win, you lose, competitive, or goes round and round and round without ever getting resolved. Typically, there is a factor within unproductive conflict related to a lack of trust. And that's a whole nother topic. You'll find some content here or over on People First Leadership Academy about trust. But the things that are, that are going on that I'm going to describe, two things, I'd like to invite you to, if, if you're looking to reduce unhealthy conflict, to reduce the conflict that impairs team effectiveness, 
then I'd like you in both of these that I am about to show you to think about within each category ways that you might inadvertently be contributing to unhealthy conflict. Could be the systems in your organization, it could be things that are said or done, but certainly worth looking out for. And the first of those is that internal competition breeds unhealthy conflict. I'd liken it to sibling rivalry. A brother and a sister, they love each other. They'd back each other up when push comes to shove, but they also both vie for mom and dad's attention. And they fight over who gets to play with which toys. They're in the same household. They have a lot of the same needs. And if they're meant to feel like they have to compete instead of both of them helping each other get what they want, well, it, it can deteriorate and it can become uh, a, a dysfunctional sort of a relationship instead of a healthy one. That's exactly the way it is in teams, whether those teams are in the same workspace or they work on opposite ends of the earth and see each other occasionally on Zoom. Nonetheless, the resource pool, the reporting structure, uh, perhaps some of the opportunities for promotions and the like, right? Th those can create some rivalries. You may be driving competition if rewards are based on individual performance without dignifying the importance of group performance. And I work with a lot of sales teams. So I, I mean this for all teams, including sales teams. It, it's pretty popular in sales organizations, uh, pretty common to have an internal tension, an internal uh, competition between salespeople. They're vying for the, the choice accounts. They are out in the marketplace fighting for who's going to get uh, which one of those accounts, who's going to land it. And if that's all there is, it can become pretty difficult to manage a team like that. You might find yourself always having to, to pick and choose who gets which account and why do they get it and how do you justify it? And you end up creating a whole bunch of rules and then nobody um, follows them. They find ways to work around them and it looks like favoritism. It can get messy, but you solve it. Whether you're at that extreme, like a sales team might be or not, you solve it by having attention around group performance as well. Sales team, sure, each individual salesperson has a, a goal, uh, a revenue goal that they're supposed to meet each month. But what if there's a spiff, a bonus for the entire group reaching their collective goal? When that happens, people don't stop working as soon as they hit their individual goal. They, they keep pressing to try to help contribute to that, that bonus. And it allows people to develop a, a better business acumen too, an understanding of what other people are doing, how they might support other people, uh, what it would take for others to be successful as well. And they're less afraid to go and ask others when they need help because others are invested. Others have a financial stake in one another's success. Be careful if you've got people vying for the raise pool. I see this a lot. Okay, team, we've got a 3% raise pool. I'll have to determine how to allocate that this year. It means some of you might get 3.5% and some of you might be getting something less because I've got to balance it at 3%. You may not mean to cause competition, but that's what you're setting up. And so when that happens, people hide their mistakes. They might sabotage work that others are doing. All kinds of things can happen that are not conducive to having really good team effectiveness. Be careful how you reward and recognize people. Don't let one person be the one who's constantly getting the glory because it'll just make other people give up. It'll make them hold back. It'll make them believe that you have favorites. Uh, all, all kinds of resentments may form over that. Conflict also happens when you set teams up with uh, a little too much autonomy that they're not ready for. And you can think back, think back to some high school group that you were a part of. It was a group project. And one person 
was really, really driven. One person wanted to get the good grade no matter what, and everybody else recognized that, and they didn't care perhaps quite as much, or they weren't um, feeling as invested for whatever reason. So they held back. They let that super achiever do all the work. Super achiever got burned out, did the work anyway, uh, and felt taken advantage of. So anytime individual interests take over and people are no longer, no longer enlisting their team members, no longer distributing the work, no longer uh, holding one another accountable, you've got a competition and an unequal distribution of work. Same thing is true. This could be department to department. Happens at senior levels quite often. Um, budget cycle. Our budget got cut this year. I'm going to ask everybody to do some trimming. And now the senior team members, they're all vying to keep everything they've got or as much of it as possible. And they start digging in each other's business. Uh, you, over there, you should cut this much so I don't have to cut any. It breeds conflict. It creates ill will. It diminishes trust. So instead, right, instead of creating opportunities for few, Look for ways to create opportunities for many, and especially look for ways for people to collaborate and get attention and reward and recognition and development based on what they're doing as a group. The second thing that really fuels the unhealthy conflict that you want to make sure to, to not be accidentally uh, doing is when you are encouraging silos. You know, silos are healthy to a certain extent. They're necessary to a certain extent. There is here in Bright Talk a whole nother 45-minute um, presentation about, about silos and how to do some silo busting if you need to. But you're potentially encouraging silos if there are a lot of bottlenecks and information is not shared. Or if there are competing priorities, I need the marketing team to do this, and I need the product team to do this, and yet the deadlines don't sync up, the flow of information, the exchange of, of process and status updates doesn't come, and now they have competing priorities. They're, they're inherently set up to compete because they are, are not getting what they need from each other. Misunderstandings and misperceptions cause a lot of silos. I'll give you an example. If you've got someone in management who's uh, promoted because of their high level of, of technical expertise, they may think that that's everything that they are supposed to do, is just continue to use that technical expertise. They may not understand at a certain level that it becomes every bit as important to cross-functionally collaborate and to get the opinions and input of other people who, of course, they don't have the technical expertise, but instead of dismissing them, you need to hear their input. So that's a, a growth opportunity. Without it, you get silos and you get some deep level conflict. If people can't get assistance from each other, or if there's an us-them mentality, oh, I'm not going to help them, right? The the people over there in finance, uh, they're they're all introverted and, and they're all mean, and they don't like anybody else in the organization. You hear these kinds of things, and if you do, you want to make sure to just eradicate that kind of thinking completely. Go back to the fundamental attribution error because maybe there's a little bit of that going on. Now, what we're after is the vital role of conflict so that you have healthy teams. We got to get rid of silos if we're going to do that. We've got to be able to, to um, keep silos for getting the work done without having silos that get in the way of everybody else in the organization getting their work done too. And we have to be careful about internal competition. It's so much better. Healthy teams, they are connected and they are one because they want to compete with the outside, the external forces, instead of having that be internal. 
So we're looking to be able to break down also the types of conflict. What I what I want to do next is show you a few of the, the classic types of conflict. Um, and I'm doing this because when you can make conflict more clinical, then you can depersonalize it. And people, when it's not personalized, they're more likely to collaborate so that they can resolve matters and get back to a, a good place where they work effectively together. You probably see a lot of this one. Everybody in most organizations could tell you stories all day long about conflict that's driven by task assignments. I'm going to strip it back here just a little bit more. If you see this, when you see this, I encourage you to think about the lack of clarity that's probably causing this conflict. So if we're having disputes about how to allocate resources, if we're having uh, disputes about who needs to be involved, if we're looking at a very granular level about my stuff versus your stuff, we are probably not clear on the big picture and what we're supposed to be achieving together. We are probably not clear about what the expectations really are anyway. So we're getting into turf wars or we are um, holding back what we ought to be contributing because we're unclear about the importance, the prioritization and the big picture that we're aiming for. Or it might just be that we're unclear about who's supposed to do what. And so nobody does it. And then that causes defensiveness. And now we're having a conflict and a whole bunch of finger pointing. So to handle that, to fix task conflicts, be clear, be clear. C collaborate so that people are open, open books. They're talking about the processes, they're talking about the standards, they're talking about their workflow, they're, they're deciding together about the deadlines. And if it can't move past that, you might need somebody to come in. It could be a mediator from somewhere else in the organization. It could be the, the manager of the team or managers if this is a cross-functional team. Either way, please notice that the manager somewhere ought to be involved. You're kicking off a team. You've just asked them to take on a, a project. It's a project team. Be clear at the beginning. Here's what's included. Here's, here's what's not included. Here's the deadline. Here's who does what. Here's our expectation. Here's why this matters. You very, very clearly set those expectations. You turn it over to the team. Let them do a team charter that clarifies even more. What are we going to do if we get stuck? Who are the resources we can access? How are we going to conduct ourselves in our team meetings? And if it wasn't set up well at the beginning, inevitably, uh, either the team is going to fall apart for lack of progress with a whole lot of conflict and discomfort, or somebody's going to have to step in and really reset. That clarity is important at the beginning. It's how you avoid all those delays and bad feelings in the longer term. Okay, so then there's this one. Interpersonal conflict also can be really detrimental to team effectiveness. It might be a personality style difference, although those are not as common as most people think. It's probably more likely a, a tactical interpersonal conflict. My style of doing things is different from your style. My approach when we have conflict is different from your approach. And I'll show you some approaches to conflict here in just a moment. Um, maybe the interpersonal conflict is not even something that we can pinpoint. It's based on some long forgotten rivalry way back in the past. It became institutionalized so the people in finance and the people in accounting, never the twain shall meet. They, they are at odds with each other. And if we go way back and we strip it all back, we can probably find that once upon a time there was some incident. And from that incident, there were misinterpretations and misunderstandings, and they became longstanding. So if there's anything like that, you, you may need to have some team building sessions. Let me know if you do. I'd, I'd be happy to help. Um, maybe you want to start off by helping people understand the differences in styles. It could be personality style, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, MBTI, 
or the DISC assessment or some other tool like that can help to, to just draw awareness. My style versus your style. Oh, I see now. There's not right, wrong, good, bad. There's just different. And if I can get to a place where I can appreciate those differences, I'm someone who's really, really pressure prompted and I like to wait till the last minute. But you're someone who's very planful and likes to have everything staged and you like to stick to that plan as much as possible. Instead of us becoming sworn enemies because of our style difference, we, we might develop an awareness that there's a time and place for each. And if we can be amenable to talking about, thinking through, holding each other accountable, um, we probably could be really good thought partners. There's, there's a lot of goodness that comes from embracing diversity like that. But it takes a little training, it takes a little practice, and it takes a, a willingness to be able to set aside some of those old, outdated kinds of feelings about one another. It is possible. People can do it. I've worked with a lot of teams who have um, laid down the path, started fresh, and been able to, to really accelerate toward team effectiveness. One more type of conflict. I want to allow some time here to talk about um, the approaches to conflict. But one more type of conflict that you may see is values conflict. We have a fundamental difference in what matters to us. I think you see this in modern times around politics quite often or around deeply held beliefs about particular issues. And any time that someone says something or does something that violates another person's values, well, that feels like disrespect. It feels like being marginalized. It, it then becomes a very deep divide because that person we judge, right? That person who feels that way, that person who follows, believes, thinks that way is fundamentally bad. And, and, and we forget that it takes all types. We forget that to get our job done, I'm still interdependent. To get our job done, maybe none of that is really truly relevant. How can I set that aside? and be able to work with this individual. We, we got to help focus back way up here, zoom out and focus on company goals and company values as opposed to individual ones, and, and certainly insist on respectful behaviors and look for overlap. Where, where do you have some things in common? What, what strikes me is oftentimes the people who are most divided have a whole lot in common. They've got a single issue that divides them but they're passionate individuals. They have some really deep level core beliefs about things that they care about, like the future of the planet or um, the impact it's going to have on their family. And if they can sort of come together in those places where they both have much more in common than they do differently, uh, that, can be, that can be an opportunity. They can both learn from each other and, and come to have mutual respect, even though they don't agree on every single thing. Now, everything I just said, I, I, I certainly don't mean that employee rights should be violated in any way, shape, or form. That, that's a matter that should be handled swiftly and through your HR department. I'm not talking about those kinds of situations. I'm talking about bringing people together as often as possible in respectful ways, even if they have differences. All right, now... One more thing that leads to conflict that's unhealthy, and you've got to get past it so you can have that vital, extremely important, healthy conflict, the kind of conflict that gets you through groupthink, the kind of conflict that, that builds, actually builds trust and commitment, the kind of conflict that allows for people to feel heard as if their voices were truly considered, and they didn't hold back, there was no false harmony. And that is an appreciation, not only of personality styles, but of conflict styles. A lot of conflict gets exacerbated because we approach the conflict differently. You, you and I, we don't agree on something. Um, and perhaps I am someone who tends to be very, very avoidant 
when it comes to conflict. So as soon as conflict surfaces, I'm I'm retreating. I just I, I'm so uncomfortable with it. And if you're someone who is what we call competing when it comes to a conflict style, you're going to dog me. You're going to come after me. You're not going to let me avoid it. You're going to either railroad me because I'm avoiding it, or you're going to call me out for it. And, and I'm going to end up feeling even worse about the conflict and worse about you. So our conflict styles, if we don't understand one another's, we can step all over, we can make judgments, and we can. this can get very messy. So this little model that I'm showing you, this comes from the Thomas Kilman Conflict Instrument Mode. The five modes of conflict, they're, they're based on the dimensions of assertiveness and cooperativeness. And I'm giving you just a very high-level overview here. There is a free workshop, a 90-minute workshop on People First Leadership Academy. And it goes much deeper into this. There's also an assessment you can take. It's, it's really awesome to do this with an entire team. I'd administer that, that assessment to each of you. And then we could have some discussions about what's the dominant style of the team when it comes to conflict. And what are the styles of each individual? And what are the pros and cons of those styles? And how can we, by understanding each other's styles, how can we be much more productive with our conflict when it happens. So the two, the two uh, items, that, the factors that influence your conflict style are, first of all, how assertive are you? That means how hard do you go after asserting your needs, your interests, your wants? And the two at the top have high assertiveness. That's called competing and collaborating. The two at the bottom have low assertiveness. Uh, I'll, hold back as opposed to putting my issues out there at the forefront. And those are avoiding and accommodating. The other dimension is cooperativeness. How much am I interested in and working toward your interests? How, how much do I care about those? How willing am I to understand them and, and to work for them? And over on the right-hand side, those two collaborating and accommodating, they have a high level of, of cooperativeness, whereas the ones on the left, competing, avoiding, have a low level of cooperativeness. So when you put it together, you, you end up with five. Five options for a conflict style. Avoiding in the lower left, right, that, that's not raising an issue because you don't want the conflict. Or if a conflict begins to surface because you have both low cooperativeness and low assertiveness, you, you move out of the conflict. You avoid it. Now, I know the word avoiding, sometimes that sounds a bit negative. But I should tell you that each one of the five styles has a right time and a right place when it is the best style to be using. So once you identify your own style and the style of your teammates, um, it's also good to understand when and how to use each of the five styles so you get a little bit more nimble. You have more tools in your tool belt to drive toward healthy competition, uh, uh, conflict rather. <laughs> I was going to talk about competing up there in the upper left-hand corner. That is an I win, you lose mentality. People who view conflict as a game or as a contest probably fall into this box. There's high assertiveness, a lot of attention on my needs, low cooperativeness. I'm not paying so much attention to your needs. Let's go over to the right-hand side, the bottom. That's accommodating. Low assertiveness, I'm not going to put my needs front and center, but high cooperativeness, I, I lean toward your needs. That means I give in. I, I make concessions. I might be trying to gain favor with the other party. The problem with this one, I know it sounds really nice, but the problem is that people who do this, um, they get to a point where they're done. You might begin to assume that that's how they are, that's how they'll always be. But you see, they've been putting lots of um, money in the bank. And they're going to want to call those chips in at some point, And it will take you by surprise when suddenly they're no longer accommodating. So that self-awareness is also good. Up, upper right-hand corner, collaborating. This is both high in assertiveness and cooperativeness. It sounds like it's the, I'm using air quotes here, it sounds like it's the best of the choices. And certainly it's worth aspiring toward. 
but this would require a lot of time. It would re require some high degree of trust and both parties would have to be fully invested in working toward this. So it's, it's a good idea, but, but it's not ideal for every situation because it requires that time and effort and trust. Now in the middle, if you have a little bit of assertiveness and a little bit of cooperativeness, you're about medium in both, well, that's compromising. And it too sounds pretty good. Everybody gets a little bit of a win. But I have to point out that when you compromise, I give up a little, you give up a little, we meet in the middle. When we do that, we are also both walking away without being completely satisfied with the outcome. So be careful because doing that, leaving something unresolved or unsatisfied, that can brew and that can become a source of, of later conflict. So when you compromise, the best way to use that is to say, here's what we're able to do now. Here are the unresolved issues. Let's keep collaborating toward those as opposed to hastily wrapping this up and, and moving on. Okay, so we're aiming for vital, confl vital conflict. It, it, it's vital, it's important, it's necessary, but we're not gonna have it if it's unproductive, unhealthy, and impairing our team effectiveness. We're looking to have all of that, a high degree of team effectiveness that includes healthy conflict. We wanna eradicate the negative influences that cause conflict, silos and internal competition. We want to be able to break it down and make it clinical so that we can talk about conflict. What, what kind of conflict are we having? Is this a task conflict? Are we having something interpersonal between us? Is there something about our, our, our values that are in conflict here? And when you do that, plus know the different styles of conflict, and you bring it all out in the open, you're going to find yourself in a much better situation. You're going to find yourself able to talk openly about conflict, about different ideas, to surface other ways of looking at something, to be able to have a, a devil's advocate on purpose so that you don't have groupthink, so that you get more ideas, more discussion, more commitment, and stronger teams. Every member is stronger, and collectively the team becomes stronger too. And if you like the way that sounds, here's the, the address again for the Academy, People First Potential.com is how you get to People First Leadership Academy. You have my email address. You've got my LinkedIn there in the attachments. Let me know if you'd like to do the TKI, the Thomas Kilman Conflict Instrument Mode Assessment with your team or perhaps individually, or if you want any sort of team building workshop. We're going to wrap it up here, and I encourage you to be in touch with me. Let me know what else you'd like to see in 2024. We're going to go ahead and um, start getting people signed up for all of the Bright Talks. And we've also got some new content on the Academy. Thanks for being here. And please don't forget to leave me a review. <music>